Well, I guess we're just going to get going. Uh, so I, uh, I, I don't have a, a whole lot of, of preparation for this. I thought I'd give uh, each of the panelists a chance to, to introduce themselves briefly. And uh, I wanted to open with, uh, with the question uh, that I'd like them each to answer, which is, what do you think the future of XML on the web is? Uh, and then I think after that, we'll open it up to questions from the floor. And if there aren't any questions from the floor, I will have to make up new questions very quickly. So be thinking of things. Save me. Um, and we'll start with uh, Robin, I guess. Unless your mic doesn't work. OK, um, so I'm, uh, uh, do, you, do you want positions or just introductions? OK. Hi, I'm uh, Robin Burgeon. I normally go to XML conferences to tell people they should do web stuff and to web conferences to, do, to tell people they should do XML stuff. Um, I've been working with uh, uh, this mess for quite a year, and uh, I love every single piece of it. What is the future of XML? Oh, so, so you want the position as well. <laughs> so the, 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 the future of XML on the web, I think, is, as discussed in the, in the previous talk, to be reincarnated, uh, to have its good parts, or perhaps its bad parts as well, reincarnated um, in, a, in a more HTML-compatible body. Yeah, I'd like to second that. I, I just introduced myself, so I think I can skip that. I, <laughs> in case you don't remember, I gave the talk before. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I would say that unless we do something like uh, XML5, uh, the, the future of XML is going to be fairly minimal, I think. We've, we've been avoiding using XML for, for any new kind of format we need, basically because we think it's too complicated for, 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 for most web developers to get right. Um, yeah. Don't need to say much more. I'm Stephen Pemberton, uh, <coughs> CWA Amsterdam. Uh, I, I've been at W3C. I've been involved with the web right from the beginning. I was at the first web conference in 94. I was on the HTML and CSS uh, working groups right from the beginning. <laughs> I the HTML working group for a decade. Uh, and I'm chairing now XForms uh, and a member of RDFA as well. Um, my position, uh, I'm, I'm, I have criticism of both HTML and XML and always have. Uh, I was tasked with the job of, of trying to produce the one in the other, the XHTML, uh, which was a, a, a bloody battle, battlefield and uh, I don't recommend it to anybody. Um, I, I think that there is room for XML on, on the web, and in fact, I do it daily, and, and I think a lot of the advantages of XML on the web have not been raised today. Uh, uh, that, that years ago, we could already do SVG plus XHTML on the web uh, for browsers that, that, that could, cope, uh, could cope with it, and that was the advantage of, of the design of XML that allowed you to do those, uh, ex that extensibility. And I still use it now for, uh, for XForms, uh, but uh, luckily there are ways of, of fooling the browsers uh, and then doing something so that it comes out in HTML, but you've at least specified it. Uh, uh, using uh, mixed uh, mixed uh, markups, uh, I think it's good to be able to devise, devise uh, uh, special task languages, which you can then merge with with other others without having to ask anybody's permission. Um, so I think that the, the model is largely largely good, uh, and and I see HTML as the, the assembly language of the web, of the future web. That uh, in the future, I mean I. I don't write very much directly in HTML or even XHTML anymore, and that uh, that I compile down to it, and I think that that's uh, that's the, the the future, that uh, a lot of stuff will be in XML, but will be displayed on the web in HTML. Yeah, Eric van der Vries. So uh, I have already mentioned. I think uh, my position can be seen from my last presentation. To summarize it, I would say that it's important to maintain convergence between XML and HTML, but in some way we already have this convention because we have a uh, wonderful parser such as TaxHoop, which uh, at the data level enables me to read any HTML, even in the most invalid HTML as an XML um, document. So it's in some way it's already done. And of course it would be much better done if there was some kind of standardization and if all the impedance mismatch were addressed in a way or another by someone like 
convergent task force and things like that. Uh, hi, Jenny Tenson. So, um, I, uh, hmm. as I said in my keynote, I think that both XML and HTML have a place on the web, in the web, um, and if HTML is, uh, and I, I kind of agree with Stephen to an extent that HTML is what we, um, what we see on the web, but what is underneath it um, can be XML, and it certainly is in my in experience and, and the kind of data that I deal with. Um, having said that, I think that there's a lot that's attractive about the other end of the panel. Um, and I'm not just talking about Robin. Um, <laughs> where, where uh, in that I agree from the evidence that XML is um, hard for people to write and it, people get tripped up on it. And if we could find a way to make it easier, then I think that there would be um, a greater adoption for it. Right, so that's our panelists. Um, this, this mic and another mic, if there are folks uh, who have questions on the floor or want to, uh, to give us direction, that would be cool. My name is George Pina from Oxygen XML Editor. Uh, uh, we we uh, create a tool that uh, allows people to edit XML, but during this process, that XML is not well formed most of the time. So we hit this problem with uh, XML not being well formed very early. Because uh, if you cannot provide content completion, you cannot provide helper to the, help to the user, right? Uh, because the document is not for, well formed, you cannot parse it. Uh, and we have also a tree on the side that shows you all the time the structure of the document, even if it's not well formed. Uh, and we did that in 2003. And the, the problem with XML is not replacing it with another specification like HTML5 that allows you to write anything. But to just, you know, you, the browser vendors can get together and say, okay, we, we get bad XML. How do we want to recover? How do we want to render that? And leave the XML as it is, allow people to write it and process it. And most of the time you have problems with XML when you get uh, input from different sources that you don't control. But otherwise, you, you can produce very, very good XML, right? And put, move this um, uh, processing that, you know, uh, reco error recovery part in another specification that the browser, in, browser vendors implement, you know, to render the XML data. And the XML specification is fine as it is, in my opinion. And it's very easy for uh, other people that want you know, to check that my document is well formed. And for, for me, for instance, we are facing with providing support for HTML5. And it's, it's, it's difficult. I mean, we already support XHTML5, and that was, you know, a snap uh, in, in Oxygen, right? But uh, now, I, when I'm thinking about HTML5, what should we do? I mean, uh, there are so many rules. What should we pre present to the user? Is this okay? Because anything is okay, right? <laughs> so, uh, as, as a user, you, you understand? So, uh, in my opinion, this error recovery should be a separate layer, a separate specification. And, you know, as we provide error recovery for the user when the user creates the document, the browsers also can provide this when uh, they render the document. Thank you. Maybe like to. So, so this isn't a direct answer to you, but uh, I, I think that draconian error uh, handling is, has, has got, got a, a worse uh, um, uh, image than it, than it really deserves. Because as, as I like to say to people, I wouldn't want anything else for my C programs. Um, that, that there are places where you really want draconian er, er, error recovery. And, and, and frankly, I think that, that the, the, the draconian error recovery should, uh, sorry, draconian should be used for developers, and then once it gets out onto the web, then it should be more fr freer, because you don't want people not getting the stuff because 
of differences between browsers or whatever. So, so that <clears throat> I, I think that 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 draconian er error recovery has, has got a, a bad image, falsely, and that that I would re I still really want it because I want to be told when my documents are wrong, uh, and I, I don't and I don't want people designing websites by suck it and see methods, which I know that they do. That you type something in and if it looks all right, then you stop. And, uh, and that there, there are lots of places where that could go wrong. Um, but uh, that didn't exactly answer your question, but at least it, it gave part of my opinion on, in that area. Well, I think it's maybe not as simple as that, because uh, an error is an error just uh, because it's specified as an error in the specification. But if you change the specification, it's no longer an error. So it, you, can, you could still have draconian error based on another specification, which would allow what we consider today as an error. So, yeah. But, but what, what I'm saying is that uh, what I'm just saying that, the, that it still it's an error, and if there's an error, I'd like to know about it. No, but, uh, so, so, I mean, HTML5 has draconian error parsing, it just has no error in the parsing <laughs> algorithm. No, um, no but the, to, 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 to rebound on, on, on this notion of authoring and, and authoring errors, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm hearing a lot, you know, not just on the panel in the room, but also on, on Twitter, people saying, how is it possible that people can write JavaScript and not be able to write a, you know, a well-formed XML document? Um, what, what's the problem? Uh, I think there's a very good experiment to, to do if you want to find out why this is a problem. Take an arbitrary uh, website written in PHP by a bad developer and try to maintain it for a month. Uh, you will understand why there are errors, why it's difficult. Um, it's because the, we, we, we're talking about amateur developers who, uh, in this case, really are amateurs, but they are the essence of a large part of our community. And I think it's very important that people can just pick up a language and, and start writing websites uh, that have advanced features without understanding a lot of things. I think this is a feature. And it, it, yes, it does mean that we get tag soup, and it does mean that um, when you're the guy who has to maintain the site afterwards, it's horrible. But I think it is helping people more than it's hurting us. Yeah, I just wanted to make two points, I guess. Uh, the first point is that um, by saying that we can process it in that way, like in the XML5 way I proposed, I did not mean to throw away well-formedness errors like entirely. Like I, I think like for checking, we, we should definitely have conformance rules and what a, a good document should be so that, uh, yeah, just like HTML has conformance rules, like you cannot use the blah, blah element but if you include it, process it this way. Um, so it definitely makes sense to have that kind of distinction and, and keep that distinction intact. I was just talking about the, the processing side. And, I, um, and the other point with regards to, to JavaScript versus um, uh, like XML, um, the way XML is built up is, is you take various, or the, the way HTML is built up commonly on the web is you take various bits together, some come from external sources, uh, some you have yourself, and you you concatenate them all together, and that's your output. Um, and JavaScript is not really done in this way. Like JavaScript is written as a single thing, a single entity that is uh, parsed and, and known to work, uh, which is which is a very different approach from uh, from each other. But also JavaScript, although it does give fatal errors, it is still sort of fault tolerant because the fatal errors are bound to a single script block. So if you include a script from a third party site that has an error and would create some kind of widget and it fails, it won't create that widget, but there are other pieces of JavaScript will still function. Um, and yeah, so it does have some kind of fault tolerance. And also if your JavaScript fails, the website will still render and, and, and things like that. Um, but um, if your primary page, which would be done in XML, if there you have all these various pieces together and there is uh, some content is coming from externally that you can't quite control, like advertisements and they have some kind of encoding error and then just your whole site falls apart and the user sees nothing. That, that's a pretty disastrous uh, situation. But just 
sorry, I, I, I just want to say that uh, my point was that instead of coming with uh, HTML5, you could tap keep XHTML5, let's say, and then the HTML5 specification could be only on the rendering part. So that, you know, people will know I want, I, I need to write this, but if I fail for any reason to, to have a well form uh, XHTML5, the processing will be with uh, the HTML5 specification, right? So that was my point. And instead of inventing uh, XML5, you can take XML and say when a browser processes XML uh, and the XML is not well formed, then we will apply the rules from XML5 or whatever that is called to, you know, still get a tree out of that and be able to render that. So that was my point, to keep uh, the XML specifications with clear rules and error handling. And on, on, on the browser side, when you want to render that, then you have another specification that says, okay, if that is not well formed, then I recover this way. Yeah, um, we, <laughs> you can do that, but you cannot make the distinction quite as clear cut, I think. Like you cannot, um, if you first process it according to the XML one rules, and then you cannot s just switch to the other rules, you would have to, you, you would want to have one set of rules. But I could see that browsers use different rules. That could be done. I'm, but I'm not really sure if that's beneficial. But, but. but if it's not well formed, right, then you, are, you have no rules on the XHTML part to, 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 to inspect anymore. So you can do whatever you want with that document on the browser side. Sure, but you don't want to, well, yeah. Here's, a, here's another way to ask the question. You say, oh gosh, you know, if you have even the least well formed error in, in the main page, it falls apart, it doesn't display. That's true. Is that a fact about the XML spec? I don't think so. I think it's a fact about the way browsers have chosen to implement things. There's nothing in the XML spec that says the page, the browser is not allowed to recover, the browser is not allowed to display the page. There's nothing in the XML spec that says if a browser gets a data stream that claims to be XML but turns out not to be XML, because it's not well-formed. Um, there's nothing in the XML spec that says what that processor has to do, because the XML spec doesn't define processing for non-XML data. So, so that's, so that's, that's the point. That's, that's very true. <laughs> this argument, this, so this argument has been made quite a few times before, and, and, and it, it is a true argument, but it does have a fundamental flaw which is the XML spec does not tell you what to do when there's an error, when there's a well-formedness error. And that, that is the problem. Because if one implementation handles that well-formedness error in one way and another implementation handles it in a different way, then we have an interrupt problem. Then you get the equivalent... Yes, we did. Testing? Yes. <laughs> then you get the equivalent of the HTML web of 1998 which is why the which XML is where we don't want to go exactly that's why the xml 10 spec introduced draconian error handling the browser vendors said you do not want to have parsers that look like ours please forbid error recovery please as far as it's possible it turns out it's extremely difficult to specify a complete prohibition against error recovery i'm i'm well aware how weak the, the statement of draconian error handling is. Uh, I think Liam's paraphrase of the other day is, is fairly correct. Uh, there's nothing that says you can't recover, you just can't say it was XML. The, um, the experience of the people responsible for the HTML parsers is what led to the draconian error handling rules. Experience in, in two forms. First, the moment one browser starts to accept certain input, the other browsers must also immediately uh, uh, parallel that handling. So you get a race to the bottom. And second, you end up with uh, data that is correct and okay only if you write a spec to say it's correct and okay. It's, um, I, I was a little nervous at some parts of uh, Anna von Kesteren's talk because you seem to be conflating getting it right with having no error messages. 
Are those really always the same thing? So you're getting it right and no error messages? Yeah. If you, if you manage to suppress the error messages that arise when part of the input has a, a wrong encoding mm. declaration, um, have you made it correct or have you just suppressed the, the signal that there was something to fix? Well, you definitely still want to signal things to developers, um, but you don't want to signal things to end users because they don't comprehend it. Like, yeah. Yeah. Internet Explorer demonstrated this when they had like, the, the script error dialogue that you could see like on plenty of sites, there was some kind of script error and there was this little red indicator and nobody got it. You definitely still want to signal to developers that something is wrong, but end users, you cannot really bother them with, with that kind of information. And, and although I think you might be right that, that the browser community of a decade and a half ago did stress to the XML community that, that their Cronian error handling would probably, might, might have been better, I don't know, I was not there. But I do think we have since learned that having error handling, but having it well defined, as was pioneered by CSS in around 2000, 2002, when they did the CSS, started the CSS 2.1 effort, I think that's been shown to be the, the better approach to, to this problem. And that approach has, has been successfully adopted for, for several other formats as well, which is that you define a format, um, you define a conformance class for the format, the restrictions within which authors can use it, and then you define also what happens in case authors do not adhere to that format as specified, which could either happen because authors made a mistake or it could be that they're using um, some kind of newish version of the uh, format where there's new features. Like in CSS, for instance, um, if you have a, a property like background, um, and initially it would not take comma-separated values, so if there was a comma somewhere there, the declaration would be dropped. Um, but the newer versions of the background property, there is a comma-separated value. And so the newer processes will accept it and older processes will drop it and, and you can actually have some kind of way, like you can declare background twice, once with a backwards compatible version and one which overrides the previous version. And so it sort of works like CSS is defined in this way where error handling is always defined. Um, if you don't recognize it, you drop the, the specific rule and continue on processing. And then newer formats of the, newer formats Newer CSS formats can be introduced that have new features, and yeah, it works. It works rather well. And in that approach, we also adopted for uh, cache manifest event streams um, the WebVTT captioning format, um, and and HTML has finally, since 2006 and now in 2012, by having it implemented and, and tested interoperably, HTML is now such a format as well, which is completely defined, and it's possible to actually add new features to HTML, which we are considering, but it's also a somewhat difficult decision because it would make it drift it farther away from XML and we sort of want to keep them the same. So it's kind of a, yeah, yeah. difficult, yeah. Here. Can you hear me? Yeah, Pavel Hlavnička is my name. Guys, are we still speaking about computers, bytes, uh, transformations, specifications, some deterministic machines? Or are we speaking just about users who needs to read something in the browser and how to fix all, the, fix all these errors? All applications we, we, we see on the web are a result of some process. Most of them are at this very moment, most of them in number of pages, but not in number of page views, are done by people just. They sat down and wrote something and it, they did it in PHP or in a templating language, they did many errors there. And we want to do error correction. And error correction, it always has some purpose. It has some level of reliability. It has some scope which can cover and some scope which it can't. So, so we are just speaking about how, how the browser parsers can recover from some errors. And there is only one purpose for this, to display the page at the end. But if we speak about web applications done by programmers, by machines produced from data with some data transformations, in this processing chain, there is just very little space or opportunity to do reliable error fixing. And people who are, who are processing data from the beginning to the end are using XML because it, it has very, very strict error rules and they are using this. And just at the very end, we have HTML applications. And quite frequently, it happens that you have this XML pipelining. It's still correct data, correct, correct, correct. And at the end, you use, you use PHP 
and you put it into <laughs> trashy uh, template, and, and you have wrong XML at the end, uh, HTML at the end. Fine, enjoy it, guys. The browsers spent all your nights just how to how to display it reliably. But why we are, if we, if we now speak about adapting or about some convergence between XML and about and, and HTML, what we just what we expect this or is, sorry, what we accept this this. Uh, this perspective that we speak about how to fix errors at the end to display it reliably. In the pipelining in between, there is no opportunity, no, no chance to fix errors reliably. And we don't want to it. Yeah? And once we, when we say that there should be some, some definition how to, how to make all these errors fixed during the pipelining, then, then if we have just three steps at the end, we get just garbage. So, so we don't want to have this like, like as, a, as a part of XML. The only valid discussion or point for the discussion for me is to say, okay, once we reach the point when we use HTML and XML at a single point, which is the browser, how to approach this. And, but it's, it's not about definition of HTML, uh, sorry, of, of XML, about reinventing. There, can, there are things to be fixed definitely and it's, we, we know all obstacles for users to use XML properly. But if you speak about the end, about the browser, just speak about how we want to mix HTML and XML and make this reliable at the very end. But we are not definitely speaking about everything before. And now this discussion is just, just turning around this point, how to, how to fix errors in XML. We don't want to fix errors in XML. We just want to present it reliably. Michael K. Saxonica. I was actually going to make a, a, a quite similar point, but in, in, in different terms. Um, firstly, redundancy. Do we want redundancy in our formats and our protocols or not? Is redundancy a good thing? I think the answer is unequivocally yes. What's the benefit of redundancy? It means that we can detect errors. It means that we can choose to correct errors. It means also that we've got extensibility. If every message means something, if every combination of bytes has a meaning, then how on earth do we extend our protocol so that we, 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 we define new messages because every message, every combination of bytes has already been used. It's already had a meaning. We can't, we, we can't define new meanings for an existing sequence of bytes. So redundancy is a good thing. And character encoding, which is the biggest thing that causes people to get XML wrong, the biggest thing that, 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 that causes corruptions of data on websites. The character codings prove that redundancy is a good thing because with character encoding errors, there's no redundancy and there's therefore no opportunity for detecting errors and no opportunity for correcting them. And, 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 and that's probably the biggest problem why we see the wrong thing. The, the other important point in this discussion about error correction versus detection versus rejection is who is the recipient? We're talking about the old-fashioned web that has human eyeballs looking at screens, and in that environment, if the data is wrong, then quite possibly the best thing to do is to show something that's an approximation, the best approximation to what the sender intended to transmit, because human eyeballs are very good at spotting the errors and, and, and getting as much information from wrong data as, as, as you possibly can. If you've got a pipeline of processing where you haven't got human eyeballs, receiving that data, but we're talking about the data web, where we've got people making inferences and interpretation and driving processes using that data, then, then attempting to, to correct the data, which probably means getting it wrong, is probably the worst possible thing to do, because then you end up with unreliable systems, unreliable processes, you end up with errors propagating down the pipeline and it being impossible to find out where they originated and what, what the originator actually intended the real semantics of the data to be. So we've got to think about who is at the end of the pipeline when we think about whether we're correcting data, or how we interpret bad data. So, um, Jirka tells me we've got about five minutes left. I think what I'd like to do is give the panelists each a chance to, to say one, one closing thought or two closing thoughts, and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up. So uh, we'll start at the other end this time. Sorry, Jane. <laughs> um, so I, 
I think that this, uh, that, that this has been quite a, a nice, productive kind of session. And um, what, what I would summarise uh, that has come out of it is um, that uh, having some kind of error recovery in XML as it, uh, w when it gets to the browser that is well-defined um, and consistent across browsers could be a good thing. But having it earlier in the pipeline could be a bad thing. Having it at authoring could be a good thing too, as long as we can output from that, from that authoring process some well-formed XML to, that, that fixes it out, right? Just serializes it out. So um, I, I, would, I would say that, uh, that this is a worthwhile thing to pursue, and I hope we do. <laughs> well, um... One of the things, I, I am wondering if we sh should call these errors, because errors is something negative. So maybe if we call these some, something different, <laughs> we will not have this kind of debate. The other thing uh, I was wondering, listening to uh, all the people here, is this notion of pipeline. Yes, it, it's very nice to say that when you're in your pipeline, you want to be strict, and outside your pipeline, you don't want to. Except that with Web.2, we know that there are a lot of added value in doing things such as mashups, and then the output of your pipeline become the input of another pipeline. So maybe things are not that simple, and maybe we, we should think more about this before coming to, to a final conclusion. Uh, I, uh, I, I disagree with the, with the idea that error recovery is, is good for beginners to learn, because uh, the beginner never gets to know that they've made a mistake and they, they, they're just seeing the result of some, some correction. So uh, I was a bit shocked to learn that if I put a div after a table that the div appears before the table in the, in the, in the DOM tree. And <clears throat> I think that if I ever wrote that, I'd want to know it immediately and not, uh, and not uh, let it be, be corrected. Um, so so I, I think actually that error, uh, that being told that things are, uh, are in error uh, is good for learning. Um, uh, I definitely don't think that it should be shown to the end user when they're the person who's looking at a website, but I think at every stage before that, people should know when they've made a mistake. Uh, what's been said so far all sounds very sensible. The only thing about, um, about pipelines I was wondering is, it doesn't really seem, to me anyway, that the parser bit matters that much. What you want there is valida validation, I think, because you want to make sure that actually the correct elements are used in attributes and, and, and so forth. So really what the parser, what kind of tree that generates is I think way less important than what the validation layer says about, about, about your data. Um, that's, that's all I wanted to add, really. Uh, so, so yeah, I, I really like the, 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 the thing that Jenny said and that a lot of people have been saying about, about being strict in the pipeline and, and being more flexible outside. And, and to me, uh, that's at least how I understood the value of XML5 in the first place, is that it's not necessarily something that you'd use everywhere, but it allows us to have a reusable syntax for documents that go on the web. And for me, one of the distinguishing features is uh, documents that will be viewed by users one way or another and for which you want to error correct because uh, when there's an error and you don't error correct for those documents then the users get punished and that's something you don't want. So I think it, it would be valuable to have a usable syntax that has um, uh, error correction at, uh, again at the end of the pipeline, perhaps at the beginning, maybe not the same, I'm not sure, uh, but in order to be able to create new formats that actually use XML5 syntax. Um, also for the learning thing, um, I think that we shouldn't be in the business of telling people how they learn and, and the way they learn or what they want to do. If, if people want to do stupid things, they should be allowed to do stupid things and then you know, live up to the consequences of it. So if you want to write crap code and it works, then go ahead, there, you'll be the guy maintaining it anyway. So. You, you will suffer, and if people want to learn, then they can use validation tools and, and lints and, and things like that. Thank you very much. Thank, I'd like to thank everybody on the panel for participating. <laughs> I, uh, I, I think it was a good session. I'm, I'm quite happy that no blood was spilled, so uh, <laughs> thank you all.